looking forward to seeing uh, if they're following any of that suggestion because I think I reported that in the history document that I submitted. So you said you actually spoke to the, the ice meister in Inso? No, not the ice meister. Oh. Uh, the, the representative of the contractor that constructed the, the cover. Oh, okay. The, yeah. the, the, the which, which company was that? Do you know? Uh, I'd have to go back and look. I, I actually spoke with him on my cell phone. Okay. To me and it, <laughs> one night, early one morning. I forget what time it was. Yeah, I'm trying to remember. I, I, I'm trying to remember the name of the firm that we went through with that one. I, I, it's it's failing me right now. Yeah, I have it in my file. I just don't have it mm -hmm. available. But if if you're at the uh, at the meeting next. Uh, Thursday, I'm, I'll have my file with me and we can set it up. Yeah, it was the same group of engineers that, that designed the Allianz Arena in Munich that uh, mm -hmm. worked on, on that particular. It was at least the engineers. The, the fabrication company was, was a slightly different one because it was, it was a new spin off. And I, I can't think of the name of it right now. Yeah, I remember filling out, filling out a survey at the St. Louis Earth Day Festival on what should happen with the rink. So cool. It is 10.03, so I think we can go ahead and get started. Welcome, everyone. Hi, Missy. Hi, Kayla. Hi, Rebecca. So um, at, as we get started, Freddie or Emily, um, because we're hoping this is going to be a very interactive, participatory conversation, how do we want to handle people um, offering questions or do we want to call on them or how, how do you suggest we run the meeting? I think, um, you know, once we get past the, the presentation piece, we can have um, folks either put questions in the chat or raise their hand and we can call on them. I think that's probably the easiest way to Excellent. do it. Okay. Shall I start? Um, welcome to today's coffee break. Um, <clears throat> I'm Hannah Roth, a member of the Education Committee. We are excited to feature this networking opportunity with our Missouri Gateway Chapter of the U.S. Green Building Council. Today we have some members and non-members of our chapter with us, so thank you for joining us. Our chapter, like many not-for-profits throughout the country, rely on funding, and the biggest source is through our membership. If you aren't already a member, please consider joining. The goal of our coffee break is to provide an opportunity for our community to engage in conversational hot topics over a cup of coffee in a, in a short, and today it'll be 50 minutes. Um, our theme for today's conversation is, do we in the building industry need a paradigm shift? Um, I'm so pleased to introduce Wiley Brown, who's going to lead our conversation today. Good morning. Hello, everyone. I'm, so I'm Wiley Brown. Thank you, Hannah, for the for the intro there. Um, and, and, you know, in speaking with Hannah about this this uh, presentation, I, I've been, been asked to be more of a provocateur than an expert. So I'm really trying to throw out some ideas to kind of, in, you know, think of big picture ideas um, uh, to, to kind of rethink how we solving some of the problems that are that we're facing today. So here, let me let me throw up my, my quick presentation. Um, where is it? Da -da. All right, and here we go. Can everybody see that all right? Yep, I can see it. Okay, great. So as, as Hannah mentioned, the, the question at hand right now is does the building industry need a paradigm shift? And um, just to give a quick intro to myself, I've spoken at, at these coffee breaks before. But I'm a professional architect. I, I have an office in both Germany and in the U.S. This is this is actually the German office, um, and we design everything under the sun, ranging from stadiums to housing to school. Uh, we actually just won a, a competition for swimming pools. But what I'm actually going to point at today more is I have a my my kind of secret background as a young man. Um, I have a background in experimental archaeology, which is um, basically looking at um, historic objects and trying to reconstruct them based off the, the ways that they were made there. So this is a project I worked on uh, many, many years ago. It's actually a human powered 
wooden submarine replica uh, called Bushnell's Turtle. It's a revolutionary war technology. And we you know, built it using period methods. And, uh, and we actually whoop, where's my, tested it both in the field and in a lab at the, at the United States Naval Academy. And um, the, you know, and so this is just an example of really what, what, what this is an exercise of doing is shifting your thinking, shifting your mentality somewhere totally different from what you would do today, because you have to strip away all uh, hydro engineering or all engineering pretty much all together. You have to strip away the tools that, you know, power tools, and you have to think, how would people in that scenario, what, what tools do they have available? What materials do they have available? What um, access to techniques do they have available? Um, and so, you know, the, another example of a project I did a little bit before that was looking at Egyptian obelisks, which was pulling away even more technology and really looking at, you know, how do you carve stone with only with stone? And how do you move and lift and, and shift massive hundreds of tons of stone um, with just basically sand and maybe some ropes and, and a lot of um, intelligent ingenuity and, and human power? Um, another one, uh, this, was, this was a bit later, was, was uh, looking at reindeer pulled sledges in the Arctic um, Scandinavia. And, you know, where you then have a very different set of, of material resources and um, in, in, in mobility. So it's really, but the, the reason I'm showing you this is because it's a shift of mentality. You have to think differently than you would when you solve a problem. You have to kind of put your heads into the minds of, of the people of that time and think about the resources they had available and solve the problems. Um, and then actually it becomes, you, you start to think about or, or start to realize what the, the social networks were or how the social uh, order was uh, adjusted or shifted in order to be able to produce these objects. So coming um, a bit more contemporary, you know, this is basically what home construction looked like in the late 1800s in North America. You know, we had that we'd go out and cut down some trees and balloon frame some, some you know, cut, up, cut the, the trees into little strips and put the balloon frame and, and nail them together. And this is what home construction kind of looks like today, which is basically the same. <laughs> we cut down some trees, cut them into strips, walk around on the job site and nail them together. And I, I always think it's kind of funny because if we, you know, it's 200 years later, we're basically still building with the same technology. But if we think about how we build our cars just a hundred years ago, if, you know, I was like, oh, here's, look at my car I just built. You'd think, you know, it might be kind of a cool classic, but you're not going to want to commute from here to, uh, to, you know, to drive to Chicago with that. Or our phones, you know, if I was like, oh, check out my phone, you'd be like, well, that's a cool antique to sit in a museum, but that's not something you want to, you know, try to schedule a meeting about the, a new skyscraper we're going to design. And so we design our phones differently, we design our cars differently, but we really still design buildings pretty much in the same way as we did a couple hundred years ago. And an interesting aspect, you know, is if you even think about wood is where does your house come from? And what we start to discover very quickly is that the wood that we're using doesn't even really come from the U.S. much anymore. About 85% of our, our um, wood that we're using, if you go to you know, Home Depot or Lowe's, is actually coming from Canada, New Zealand, Brazil, uh, Europe. And, and so we're, it's not even has nothing to do with regionalism anymore. Even though we have this kind of nostalgic idea that we grow trees here, we don't actually build with trees. And then the other question is, is what climate is your house actually designed for? You know, is it designed for the, the wildfires out in, in California, or is it designed for the flooding in Houston, or let alone the flooding in St. Louis? Is it designed for the, the snowfall in Colorado? I mean, if you look at all these houses, look pretty much the same. Is it designed for the dust storms in Arizona? Well, honestly, I mean, we look at the country and it has climate zones that are very radically different. But this is pretty much the foundation for most of our homes still today that we're, we're building is a colonial house that um, you know we started building with back in the 1700s and that becomes the same model and we basically modify it to our local climate using mechanical systems and just adding energy into it to to make it fit and so it's actually not adapted to any of the climates that we're building in in this country it's actually adapted for a con an island off the western coast of of europe that has a gulf stream and a whole different set of climatic conditions but yet we pretty much build that way across the country you know, so which cl climate region is this? You know, it's the whole nation, but why do we use the same set of materials in all these different areas? And so what's the alternative? Well, 
The alternative, it, 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 this is a fun story that I, I like. This is Plymouth Plantation in Massachusetts. And they actually have reconstructed um, the initial Plymouth village using uh, you know, period technologies. It goes back to my experimental archaeology days. And, and it's a, there's a funny story that my, my, my stepson told me is that you know, he, he, we used to, I used to live in Plymouth and they would go there every Thanksgiving uh, for school trip. And he'd always talk about, okay, you go to the, the houses here and you know, everyone, it's, it's cold because it's November and everyone's wearing a huge jacket. And these houses are ridiculously cold and they have a huge fire going, but it's still, there's no heat going on because it's not insulated. And it's just, you know, these boards attached to, to uh, these, these timbers. And it's interesting. It looks pretty much like how we build the day still, except we have some thatch, but based fundamentally the same thing. And, and they're cold, but then you, you go over to this other section, which actually is a replica of a, of a Wampanoag Wetu, which is authentically made as well, using bent birch staves and, and oak bark. And, and, and my stepson always say, you go in there and it's awful because it's so warm and so comfortable. And you have to take off your jacket and there's like people hanging out inside and basically like shorts and a t-shirt. And I always think that that's <laughs> the perfect example of what passive house would be. It's a, a, a technology, an indigenous technology that's perfectly adapted to the climate based off local materials. And the only reason that it wasn't adapted by the colonialists is because it's, you know, it's considered, oh, but that's not a real house. That's primitive. That's a primitive hut. And, you know, so there's this idea of a colonial mentality, which is you go into a new space or you go and you try to adapt the, that context or that environment to your own sense of what is right or what is appropriate or what is, what is righteous, as opposed to an indigenous method of thinking. Again, this is going back to social theory where you actually adapt to the region's materials and context. And I wanna really, as we move forward, I really wanna think about these two mentalities of a, of a colonial mentality, where we try to adapt to the world to, to our needs or to an indigenous mentality, where we really try to adapt to the context around us. And think of these as two different kind of feuding ways of thought. Because you look at this, I mean, this is a, an amazingly adapted, um, low energy construction. It's tucked, uh, you know, this is a desert. It's tucked under a cliff. It's built with local materials. It's, this is actually an urban condition. And so the, the whole lifestyle, the whole way people live and work and build is a reflection of the, the given conditions. But so, okay, with that in mind, here's where we sit today. You know, we've had excessive heat, both in Europe and the US all summer. And, and you know, actually people beginning, you know, injured and sick and dying because of it. It's a, a pretty major thing. Or even more close to home, um, we've had some incredible flooding. And so the question that I want to just throw out there is, you know, these are pretty big problems that are really right up in our face right now. And how can we address them in a way that is actually not creating more problems? How can we address these questions in kind of um, in, a, in a different way of thinking that, that maybe solves them or, or, or doesn't necessarily solve them, but, but adapts our current conditions, which is, you know, here's a street skate in Fox Park. We can't get away from the fact that we can't just like it would knock this all down and like, let's adapt to the region. We have infrastructure in place. We have something there. But how can we start to adapt what we have under a new paradigm, a new set of circumstances and a changing environmental context? to actually lower the amount of energy we use, ad address the, the, the flooding, and, and you know, think about the streetscape um, in a different way than we have, that maybe is, is more um, uh, holistic or more um, you know, communal, rather than uh, simply a, a functional a solution of, of getting cars and people into their, their doorways. So uh, we had a wonderful conversation with, with Michael Willis that I'd like to start with to provoke this conversation a little bit further. And um, here, let me, let me switch my, my screen. And then I'd like to open this up, to open up a conversation to, to uh, again, I'm not an expert in this. I'm trying to provoke some questions. So let me change my, my screen. And then Wiley, if you do see, um your Zoom settings kind of floating black box. Um, yeah. If you can just kind of minimize that, I think okay. that would help as well. Okay, it has it been in the way most of the time here? Yeah, ju but just at the top of the presentation screen, so. Okay, I can't figure out, 
now we see the full black box again. Um, Here, let me try. Let me try that again. One second. Yeah, I'm not sure why my my, my screen. I'm, I I was a Zoom expert for a while there. Now it seems I've I've lost my my. Oh, no, that's not what I wanted. One more time. Okay. Do you see the black box there? No. Okay. So let's. I'll go with that. Actually, I, I think I forgot to click something. No, no, it's all perfect. Okay. Let's do this again. Okay. So here's a quick little conversation starter, and then we will open it up for the for the the, the group. Good morning. I'm Hannah Roth, um, past chair of the USGBC. We're hosting a conversation this morning, an open conversation to, con to consider different ways of dealing with the problems and potential solutions that our built environment faces in light of the extreme drought, extreme heat, and record breaking uh, rainfall. Um, we're asking the question does the building industry need a paradigm shift? Today, we're thinking in design terms, searching and thinking about new ideas. We are not concerned about implementation, financing, building codes. Those practical considerations are for another day. I'm joined today by Wiley Brown and Michael Willis. Wiley, would you like to take the conversation? Sure, sure. I'll go ahead and start. So yeah, I'm Wiley Brown. I'm a, a practicing architect. Um, with offices that are both in, in Munich, Germany, and in, in the US. And I'm also a professor of architecture at Washington University. And I think it's a, it's a really interesting topic, particularly, I mean, having experience in, in two continents of how to address um, climate change and in different you know, ways, particularly in, in, in urban areas, as well as, as um, suburban and, and rural areas, but, but just seeing how different two different countries and, and two different kind of worlds think about it, but really recognizing that we there's a pressing topic here that I think we we tend to look at uh, in silos and, and taking a step back and looking at it at a, in a broader perspective, I think is necessary to really consider because these things are, are right up in our face and we need to do something now, but but they can't necessarily be done at a macroscopic level. Um, um, but maybe we can we can think clever about how to adapt situations we have into something that's more more useful. Hi, uh, Michael Willis. I am uh, an architect born in St. Louis. I have had I worked in practices both in St. Louis and in California, where I am now. I uh, I opened my own office in 1988, and for much of it, I focused on uh, water infrastructure as a prime um, aspect of practice. Other stuff as well, but it's it's the water infrastructure that brings to this conversation. And I'm interested in this because yes, uh, St. Louis is my hometown, and I have seen some uh, precedents. I'll call them that could be of use. But the first thing that's of use is that we're actually having a conversation about it. And I think that's where we can really benefit from just the open thinking of what the problems are and maybe pointing towards some, uh, yeah, pointing towards some solutions, but really pointing toward the desire, the aspiration to reach a solution. Right now, we're, we're, uh, we're seeing the we're seeing the effects and the examples of what extreme weather can do, and so I hope this conversation will help get some ideas flowing about what we can do to address it. In earlier conversations, one of the uh, starting place uh, that Wiley and I had was the thought of when you watch the extreme heat in in uh, northern Europe, it's like as as designers, as um, problem solvers, like what, what's possible? What, what could be done now that would have a huge improvement, a huge impact 12 months from now, 18 months from now? Everything that's being done currently is really important, but it happens at such a slower scale. What, what can we draw upon when we think about um, 
catastrophe relief, you know, when there's an earthquake, when there's a huge tsunami, disaster relief people come in um, and, and they don't have five years to set up a program. So is there anything we can draw from their way of thinking or problem solving um, that we could use now? Well, um, from from my standpoint, uh, I'm, I've, my examples are all domestic and not international, but um, based on uh, some of our past projects, say in post-Katrina uh, New Orleans, when we see what happens when we, uh, let's say, ignore the lessons of the, of the levees, and yes, once everything gets flattened, uh, we're, we, we, we jump to the solution and we've come up with some pretty good solutions, but what we are less, uh, less good at is the preparation beforehand. Uh, before the disasters happen, uh, after the disasters happen, I see a lot of mobilization, but I think this is, this is where, this is the mindset that we have to work with here, not just, okay, what do you do when the levee breaks mm. and it, you know, wipes out 80% of your city's population as happened in New Orleans? What do you do uh, after the, my experience in 1959 tornado when, St. Louis was mostly flattened. Uh, what do you What do you do afterwards? Is uh, is 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 what we can do as practitioners and as but what do we do? How can we anticipate the uh, the disasters and think about mitigation before it blows the roof off your house or before the uh, the culverts fill up and flood flood your flood your houses. So that's that's to me that's where the conversation is. It's a, in the mindset of what happens uh, while we have the time to think about a possible solution before it actually hits us. Yeah, I mean, what I also wonder is is it is is, is about you know solutions versus adaptations. And, and thinking of, of, you know, kind of big engineering, let's dig up all the streets and relay all the pipes, which, you know, that's a huge undertaking when requires massive funding and, and disruption. And versus, versus solutions that, that can be kind of managed at the, at the, at the homeowner level or the street level or, the, or, you know, at the smaller bits that add up and accumulate into to larger uh, effects. What are some like really kind of on the ground responsive or maybe maybe reactive uh, is is a better um, solutions that could be implemented quickly and and intelligently, but without take without being without solving just one problem, you know, because I think that's that's where it becomes tricky is when we when we just try to solve this one thing and it creates four other problems down the road. Can we can we try to solve something that that also helps reduce the heat? Or the impact of the heat, you know, in that situation, but doesn't increase energy use. For example, you know, it actually maybe decreases energy use, and it's a matter of readjusting. Um, you know, so it's 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 uh, how we we uh, consider, you know, what comfort levels are. Uh, one of the lessons that we learned in our um, post Katrina work was going back over a hundred years and looking at how houses were designed to climate. So sure, you could build a box and air condition the heck out of it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, but what lessons could we get from those houses that were, you know, uh, you know pre, well, certainly pre-Katrina, but <laughs> basically houses that were designed to climate. And we took some of those lessons and put them in 
the new housing that was built. Mm -hmm. Even if they were small in footprint, they were very tall, tall, skinny windows, so the double hung sash, so you could drop the top sash up there with a fan yeah. that could that could uh, blow the heat out so it reduced the amount of uh, artificial cooling you would need by by basically finding a way to, to vent out the uh, the excess heat and um, so we used some of those examples and like how did how did you know how did you how did how were houses designed uh, before you could close up the boxes, which is I think mm -hmm. an unusual notion. Close up the boxes and then fill it full of air conditioning. And there are some other uh, health benefits of having airflow. Uh, it reduces mold. It uh, you know you it it gets you used to. Uh, a different set of temperatures, so every house you walk into in the summertime isn't 62 degrees. Yes, when we were looking at a, a similar a similar project in Houston called Freedman's Town, it's one of the last intact black neighborhoods close to downtown, but built in the same way as uh, a lot of those single family homes I'm talking about in New Orleans. Very skinny, designed to climate, and you know and getting some lessons from that well we were we were in uh our app was at the federal reserve bank in houston because it was exactly perpendicular to freedman's town which went straight to downtown and the the federal reserve was perpendicular to it so we could sit in the conference room and look down the line at all of these houses pretty cool uh actually very cool Everybody in the Federal Reserve yeah. building was wearing a three-piece suit, buttoned up because it was, you know, it was yeah, yeah. it was uh, insane. It was 60 to 65 degrees in there. Mm -hmm. And anyway, so that's the idea. It's like, is there a way to design? Is there a way to design um, for climate that anticipates some of these concerns? Um, and Michael, you know, I'm, just gonna, I'm gonna add to this one of the things that um that attracts me to what you're talking about is that these are low tech mm -hmm. these are low tech solutions and in a way we're going back to all those things we've forgotten we used to know how to do yeah. um and i think um you know there are small updates i know that in st louis a lot of people who unfortunately don't have air conditioning have Real security concerns about opening windows, um, but I think, but, but I think there there are new like window assemblies that can offer open windows and security at the same time. So going back to these low tech older solutions, are it's a really viable approach. Yeah, I mean, that's what, that's what I, always always struck struck me interesting. Is you go to Europe and, the, and it's much more prevalent. Double hung basically don't exist in Europe. You have usually what's called a tilt turn, which means the window will tilt, you know, just a little bit, and so you can get a, actually a good bit of airflow, but you can't sneak in, or you can turn it and, and it opens inward. It's easy to wash, and that's like a, that's yeah. like a standard window strategy there, and it's actually oh, yeah. a security measure. So people will leave there. You know, garden terrace doors are also tilt turns. So they'll tilt in, leave them open, and and you can't actually get in. There's no way to, to break in, but air is flowing through. I mean, this this yeah. is where you know to kind of bring it closer to home. You take a, a place like let's let's look at St. Louis and say like, okay, we have major heat island issues and heating in the city, and let alone the floods that happened a couple of weeks ago. But like, what are what are some simple adaptations that we could implement? you know, that are, that are, that could start to remediate some of these things and, and, and reduce the, the load of air conditioning. You know, I think it is, you know, allowing some air to flow through or, or designing things, you know, cause we, ha we, we have things in place and how do you adapt those in, in a kind of a low tech, simple way to, um, to start to address some of these issues? Well, some of it I think is mindset. Um, the, the idea, even in uh, in Germany, even in uh, you know, 
office buildings, uh, it is rare to find one that doesn't have an operable window. So you, you get used to the idea of living in a, a, an environment that, no, it's not going to be 60 degrees, it's a little warm, but the air is moving and you're comfortable. Um, and yeah, that, that window, that kip finster, you know, where- Yeah, the, the, the kip, the kip dre, <laughs> dre kip. <laughs> Or you can open it on another hinge, but it, yeah. and it and it, we you know uh, I've I've seen them, I've seen them everywhere from villages to Berlin, you yeah. know, and it's, yeah, yeah, exactly, it's a, yeah, it's, a, it's it's just the way they gotten used to living with the climate. Um, uh, and, and, sorry, no. In addition, I grew up in Pittsburgh, where people had uh, attic fans. And they're thought to be this kind of um, dinosaur now. But it's again, it's a very low tech um, addition, you know, that when you, once you get the windows open and you get that attic fan going, um, it can be really comfortable and you don't have, you know, fans in every room, et cetera. But it, it means going back to a way of thinking in a good sense. All right, I think I'm gonna stop it there. And so that was just a you know a little conversation starter to uh, to whet our appetite with being able to think from both a, a broad perspective of really how we're approaching things to even you know looking at it from a a um, a specific level. But this, again, just wanted to open up that the, the the conversation with this idea of like what are some means that we could um, start to address some of these these big issues without necessarily thinking of it as as a uh, you know massive state level overhaul of all of our infrastructure. <laughs> so is there, you know, can, can we uh, incrementally, but on a massive scale, really have a better understanding of what's, what's at foot and um, approach it in a, in a decentralized way? And so I, I leave it at that. That's my question. And I'd love to hear people's thoughts and comments. Hi, um, Tom Brayford here. I don't, I don't see a way to raise my hand. So is it all right to just jump in? <laughs> Can you hear me? It's fine with me. Go ahead. <laughs> all right. Um, well, I've, I've heard a lot of solutions from everybody that's spoken so far. And I, so um, first of all, it's really great that we're having this conversation. It has been missing for so long, and it, it drives me crazy that these solutions are, are there if, if we just get in communication. And one of the last things that, that uh, Michael said was that uh, uh, the mindset is one of the things that get, get in the way. And I think, um, Wiley, when you talked about right, appropriate, and um, uh, I forget what the, the other one was. I don't know either. I, I, <laughs> yeah. But uh, that uh, gospel, <laughs> I think, was it, you know. And I think we've just uh, built with uh, sticks and bricks for so long that, um, that that's, that's uh, become uh, you know, people can't imagine doing it any other way. And, um, uh, but I think, but I think uh, there, it's somewhat of a false equivalent to say we either have that, that choice, right, or appropriate, or, um, or gospel, and, or, or going back to the indigenous ways, you know, that's, I don't, I don't think that's going to happen. But I, but I think, we can be informed by the way St. Louis was originally built and evolved. Um, so, uh, you know, I live in a 130 year old house that um, uh, I'm sure the way it was built where there were a few small crews uh, that uh, used oxen or, or horses to scoop out the, uh, for the basements and that uh, clay was hauled to local brickworks and they brought bricks back. And 
Uh, the lumber was harvested in the vicinity and there were local mill works that uh, turned that into these uh, four by full four by uh, uh, four uh, studs, you know, which got has have gotten skinny down more and more over time, and um, and and uh, you know built the used local stone and and built the foundations and then and then the brick walls and 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 then the the balloon framing or the framing inside. Um, um, do you have a question? Do you have a question, Tom? We have several hands up. Oh sure. Uh, so. I, I think what we need to do is, is look at, at both how we can be informed by the past, but also, also by the future, where things are going uh, with the climate and with new materials and new ways to do things. Um, but also, also Hunter Lovins did a, put out a book and I can't remember it a, two, three years ago. And one of the points she made in that is that we've got to buy some time. And one of the ways to buy time is to figure out how we can utilize local materials because so much of the carbon footprint uh, comes from just having this multiplicity of, of materials and shipping them from great distances. And I've been talking to a company in Canada, Roadpacker, that uses a non-toxic, um, organically derived material to harden up uh, mixtures of, of clay and sand to build roads that are, are less permeable. And they've also created some, some building systems with uh, blocks. And, so and Tom, this is great. Could you put the information into the chat so we could all go and review it later? I, I really no, want to no, get. No, I'm I'm so slow. At, I'm so slow at at the chat. Okay. I would miss the whole rest of the program. Okay. But, but thank you for. Mm -hmm. thank, thank you. Thank giving you. me a little bit of time. Why don't we jump over to John Bell? He's had his hand up for a, for a while. Yeah. Um, so I just I just took a couple notes um, while you all were talking and while the video was going. So uh, I think a lot of people have been mentioning attic fans, and that, I think that's. That's great. Um, I recently had this conversation with my grandparents when, you know, temperatures were really spiking. Like, you know, how did you guys cool your houses before um, everybody had AC? And pretty much the thing that they all brought up was attic fans. Um, I recently discovered that my house has an attic fan for that purpose. But unfortunately, um, the people that lived in the home last, they went through and they redid all the windows and none of them are operable. So unfortunately, that's, an ex that's a technology that I have in my house, but it's currently no longer, um, it's no longer operable. So I think awareness of those types of technologies is really important and just like the existing features of older homes um, can really help some people. Um, Tom, you brought up bricks, like building sticks and bricks is how we construct homes. Um, I, I had done a little bit of research in the past on why, um, bricks were so prevalent. And I don't, I don't know how effective this is, but I do know that with the high thermal mass of bricks, your home cools off at night. And a lot of times those bricks will absorb, continue to absorb the heat well into midday, um, Back in my old home, which had probably like a foot of brick um, on all the exterior walls, we wouldn't have to turn on any air conditioning until um, afternoon, usually when it got really hot. Um, let's see, I got I got two more, I think. Um, some of the thoughts that I've been having specifically on how homes are structured and laid out, um, I think a lot of that could you know, since we're talking about paradigm shifts, how can we lay out the home better so that it's, um, it requires less air conditioning. So one example that I'm thinking of is like where the kitchen's located. Um, in my current home, kitchen's located right in the middle. So in the summer, when you want to make a big meal, all that heat just goes throughout the entire house. Yeah. And you've got to, you've got to cool the whole thing off again. So like, if there's a better way to ventilate that kitchen, kind of the way that um, 
industrial kitchens do it where they just suck out all the hot air and they don't typically cool those spaces. Um, maybe that's one potential solution to this. And then. John, John, yes. this is Hannah. Are you aware that the kitchen used to be a separate little building in the backyard <laughs> I, so, that, yeah. so that you heated it up and it didn't get to the rest of the house, you know, so you have to, was, question, you have to question putting the kitchen in the middle of the house. Right. Well, and for obviously for different climates, that makes sense. Right. So there are some, if you live in a cold area, um, I have heard of some people heating their homes with, there's these really old ovens. I don't know what they're called, but you essentially keep them on all the time. And it sounds really inefficient, but if you're in a really cold climate, people use this to heat their houses too. And it ends up being that you basically don't use much energy at all for cooking. Um, but yeah, I like, it would be cool to have a kitchen, maybe not outside, but maybe kind of like how we think of a current detached garage, you know, um, kind of like a separate space in the house. So that would be pretty cool. Um, so I think, I think we're starting to run short on time. Okay. So if you don't that, have a question, that, John, I'd like to move on. Yes, that's fine. Thank you. Why don't we have Ralph uh, that I think he's been had his hand up for a while. Mm -hmm. Come on. Susan's next, actually. And then Ralph. Oh, sorry. Yeah, no worries. No worries. Thank no you. No problem. You know, uh, the question is about using bamboo, which grows like a weed and, and as more of a wood building <laughs> material. <laughs> yes, I'm hearing him saying yes. And then also <laughs> what Mike said about um, mindset. A lot of the people who built, uh, it's been my observation that homeowners that built uh, to the climate were considered counterculture um, and they were, you know, outside of main society. So, you know, we, one guy builds a colonial house, the next guy has to build a bigger colonial house, the next guy puts an island in the center of his house, the next guy got to put in uh, another island, a bigger island. But uh, I mean, <laughs> if you don't have a kitchen outside, you can have, you should have a north facing kitchen <laughs> to keep it cool. So I think it's mindset. And I think if we, except some things that are outside the mainstream. And again, I love this conversation, opening up our minds as architects and engineers uh, to those things. And we can't, Tom, in my opinion, uh, go back to indigenous built because the land is different than it was pre-colonialism. So we have to work with what we have. I think that's my comment and my question, but how about bamboo? <laughs> That, that's my main line of research, actually. So I'm, I would like to talk to you more. The first person is like throwing it back at me. <laughs> it's usually resistance. So I love it. Grows like a weed. And then you can eat it. You can make clothes out of it. Uh, and yeah, okay, perfect. That's my comment. Thank you, Freddie. Thank you, Hannah. Thank you, Susan. Hi, can you hear me all right? Great, thanks. We're, we're actually working on a project with Washington University. It's going to have a lot of bamboo. It's going to have bamboo structural members, bamboo exterior cladding, bamboo floors. Uh, and uh, so, so that's, that's our first use of major use of bamboo like that. But what, what I really wanted to comment on is I really like this idea of a paradigm shift in architecture. And I think what we're talking about is reframing what the definition of excellence in design really is. So it's very fair to ask ourselves today, is, is a design, can a design be excellent if it's not paying attention to climate, if it's not paying attention to equity, if it's not looking at healthful materials, things like that. And so, um, you know, I, the other thing I've noticed is when we really drill down on any one of those, including resilience, um, it really starts to drive uh, the design in a big way. And uh, any one of those, for instance, climate, um, it, it actually affects all the other issues too. It affects resilience if we design for climate, it affects equity. Um, it doesn't necessarily affect healthful materials, but it can, when, especially when we look at low carbon materials. Uh, so those things are all related. And I, I really think we're talking about um, the paradigm shift is really in what it takes to have design excellence today. Thank you, Emily. How much more time do we have? Yeah, we've got about five minutes or so until ten. You know, so, four minutes, four or five minutes. Um, 
Michael Willis, who um, you saw in the taped uh, presentation, um, Michael will be teaching this fall at Washington University School of Architecture. And so Michael and Wiley and I, um, we're very interested in continuing this conversation, whether it's very informally at a brewery or whether it happens in a classroom someplace. So, you know, please, please let us know if you want to continue this conversation and maybe with Emily and Freddie's help, we can have another uh, presentation of some time, you know, before the Christmas holidays. Um, the other um, scale that I wanted to bring up, and it's something that Wiley brought to my attention when we look at flooding. So here's a paradigm shift. What if engineers could analyze how much water in the flash floods mm -hmm. that take University City that the MSD sewers could actually handle. And then they, with that calculation and the rainfall, then they know how much water just cannot be handled by MSD. And so we could have a flash flood next summer or the summer after. So then as engineers, how many rain gardens, how many locations of rain gardens or retention ponds could be found in University City. And, and now we're thinking as designers, whether it's on private land, public land, how many catchments, how many storage areas would need to be set up so that there'd be no flooding the next time we have a rain like we just had. Now that's thinking at a very different scale than how to adapt a house. But um, I also want to encourage all of you to start thinking at that scale, which is really outside the box. And, and it's a matter of looking for ideas. It's not who would implement it or whatever, but it's something that could be done in 12 months or 18 months. And because we, we, we have run out of time, we have just run out of time. That's just, just to tag on that, I'm gonna quickly share my screen again. And then I'd, I'd like to get Missy's comment because we haven't heard from her yet, but um, looking back at this picture of a basic street, and this is in Fox Park area, it's right near my house of looking actually how much asset of space we have on that street picture. You know, there's there's some green lawns, but you know, you look at a majority of that picture is actually an enormous streetscape that's a basically like almost like highway scale. And you start thinking about, you know, could we start shrinking the streets a little bit to slow down the traffic, which we're trying to do anyway, and add some more green? And where can we actually capture opportunities? Where are there you know, possibilities and, and that, that we, we, we look at what's actually there. And, you know, on the other side of what Hannah was saying, that the calculations, we say like, where are the opportunity zones that we could, and not opportunity zone in the, in the there's that's, I know that I, I hit a term that's something else, but where's the opportunity in that picture? You know, maybe it's only a hundred square feet in that picture, or maybe it's 500 square feet. Could we, you know, put a median down the middle? Could we thin up the lots? Do we have to have double parking on both sides? And where can we actually start to, um, capture everywhere and in the city to add up to a huge amount of, of permeable area. And I'd love to hear from, from Missy. Go ahead. So I am not you. I'm not a professional. Gina Hilberry is my architect I moan and groan with, personal friend. Um, but I'm an elected official in a community where right now, in our planning and community design commission meeting, there's been the community outraged at the flooding that occurred. And um, I've been elected official for 22 years and I have seen my community go from the little itty bitty homes to these bigger homes with larger areas of what would be uh, considerable runoff of water. So what I wanna say is, I'm here to learn. And when you said, Hannah, whatever you said, our Olivet Farm and we're over there saving that little three month baby in all that flooding in University City. And it's happened in my community because you used to have smaller homes in these subdivisions. Now you've got the homeowners buying these smaller homes, creating larger homes, and the infrastructure from MSD is not there. And so you've got tons of larger homes now feeding into a sewer system that, you know, last night, the inlet, will the inlet work? Are the pipes big enough? So to me, <laughs> you guys, this water issue is hitting every community. And that's where I'm taking my city to, you know, you know, MSD has its priorities, but how do we 
If MSD can't be there, how do we begin to help when the, the, the topography of the land goes down as well? This used to be a pond in the area where, where, where development is in, in, in all of that off of Old Bonham. Um, so to me, you know, the question after last night's PCDC meeting in Kibitzing was, you know, you know, put a big retention, you know, pond or retention, you know, catcher in there. But how do you do that when you no longer have the right of way? And, and, and it would be multiple, you know, uh, uh, properties where there really isn't space to put it. But that could be a solution because MSD is not going to have the money for the infrastructure changes that would be looking for here would clearly be four hundred to eight hundred thousand dollars, and no community has the money for that, and MSD doesn't either. So I'm looking for, you know, ideas that you need to bring back to my guy Carlos, um, in, in any city, you know. As we look at, you know, people telling me this hundred year floods happening every week or every other year, it's not a hundred years anymore. What is the solution to cities that are already built up? You know, all of that's a city, a, a little municipal city that is already built up and is being more built up by the larger homes. So to me, I'm just spewing that back to you as to, I don't have the solutions. I tell my city, I'm the dreamer, you're the doers, but I hear the moans and groans and then people then saying, you, the community, you, the government have got to solve this because you, the government have allowed these homes to be built. So, you know, that's a perspective from the elected official that says to you guys, you got to come up with something because we don't know what it is and we got to get MSD and others to be able to be agreed to this as well. And I don't know how that really fits into this water conversation today, but but I'm only here to learn. But having this issue front and center right now in my community, I've got to share this and say, I, I want solutions and I don't know what they are because MSD is not going to give them. I think we're out of time, but that is was, I think, the perfect closer for the start of this conversation because <laughs> that is, I think you, you summed it up, uh, Missy Walden, that was... Uh, a brilliant and, and exactly where we're at today. And, and we have to think differently. We can't just rely on MSD and, and big retention ponds. And, and, and it's really looking at um, new ways of thinking about it and new ways to actually solve a real problem that's pressing right now. Thank you for that. That was great. Um, Emily or Freddie, how, how do we close off the meeting? <laughs> Well, I guess we just want to thank everybody for joining us. Um, this was recorded and um, live streamed on YouTube, so it'll be available there um, if folks want to share it. And just, um, I didn't, I didn't bring up our upcoming events, but we do have a happy hour the first Thursday of every month, so that's coming up in September. And then our next evening program um, on September thirteenth uh, will be a net zero showcase. Um, and there are additional coffee breaks scheduled out um, in September and October, but we can definitely figure out where we might be able to pick up this conversation uh, going forward, because I think it is important um, and it is, it is a good thing to keep talking about. So thank you, Wiley and Hannah, and also to Michael, who couldn't be here today, but for his recorded uh, contributions. So. Thank you all as well. Yeah. Great conversation. Have a great, have a great Friday. Thank you. Happy Friday. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Wiley. Thank you, Emily. Thank you, Freddie. Bye, Thank everyone. You. Thank you.